$75,000 per year. This is the number often referred to as the cutoff where more money will no longer bring you any more happiness. This is largely in thanks to a widely misquoted 2010 study conducted by these two gentlemen, Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton. Since this was published, all manner of outlets have perpetuated this idea that conveniently falls in line with other tropes like money can't buy happiness and money is the root of all evil, mo money, mo problems, you get the gist. The issue, though, is that it's simply not true. Welcome to the first video made by How Money Works. If you enjoy this video, please consider liking and subscribing. The first clue for anybody misquoting this study should be in the title of the study itself. High income improves the evaluation of life, but not emotional well-being. What this means in plain English is that people with higher incomes don't necessarily experience higher levels of day-to-day -day happiness. However, long-term, they do generally have a more positive outlook on life. This phenomenon is most likely to be explained by the psychological theory of the hedonic treadmill. The hedonic treadmill is the observed tendency of humans to revert back to a relatively stable level of happiness, in spite of any major life changes, positive or negative. Let's put it this way. If you win the lotto, you will probably lose your mind from happiness. But as time passes and you swiped your card more times than you can count, the novelty of the situation will have passed. This is not because of entitlement, it's just human nature. This is your new normal. The same effect happens in reverse. If you get fired tomorrow, you will no doubt experience a drop in happiness. But after you break the news to your friends and family and find a new job, you will eventually return to a relatively consistent level of happiness. Now, there is a bit more to this study than just one quirk of human psychology. Another component most people tend to overlook is the process by which these researchers eventually came to their conclusion. The study was conducted on 709,000 households which were asked to give details about their income and then answer questions pertaining to human happiness. How often do you feel stressed? How do you think your life will look in five years? How often do you smile? You know, the questions you ask on that awkward first date. Their answers then produced a score on the Cantrell Ladder, which is a general ranking system rating people from hopeless depression to thriving prosperity. What was interesting is that this study suggested that the USA, where this study was conducted, actually did very well generally in day-to-day -day indicators like smiling, laughing, and enjoyment of activities, but did very poorly in long-term indicators like stress, where the nation was the fifth highest out of 151 other countries where similar studies had been conducted. Overall, though, the 709,000 households did quite well with the average Cantrell score of 6.76 out of 10, which puts it into ninth place of all studied countries, behind only Scandinavia, Canada, Switzerland, and New Zealand. So don't worry, the American spirit is alive and well. But alas, here is what most people get wrong. More income did noticeably increase long-term happiness indicators in households being studied. It just didn't really have much of an impact on short-term indicators thanks to our good old friend, the hedonic treadmill. $75,000 a year is the generally accepted point at which money doesn't become a day-to-day -day struggle, but may still be a limiting factor towards more long-term goals like buying a house, getting out of debt, retiring early, or simply going on a nice vacation. Or at least that's the massively oversimplified, albeit far more accurate, conclusion. Furthermore, most people quoting this study still ignore two other major problems with this number, the variables and the timing. In general, science experiments, there are variables. The dependent variable here is the short-term and long-term happiness of a household. The independent variable is the total annual household income. However, to have a direct correlation in a perfect study, other variables must be controlled. This study assumes that all households function exactly the same, which is obviously not true. To a young single professional with a low cost of living, no student loan debt, $75,000 per year would actually be extremely comfortable. But to a family of five, paying off a mortgage and student loans all the while living in the city of Los Angeles, this income would be entirely inadequate. Another factor of concern that people tend to gloss over is the timing of the study. These results were published 11 years ago, and since then, due to inflation, $75,000 per year would actually be around $90,000 per year, which is starting to look like a much higher benchmark for day-to-day -day happiness. Another problem with quoting figures from 11 years ago, particularly as it relates to people's finances, is the big elephant in the room. 
the global financial crisis. In 2008 and 2009, as this data was being collected, people were living through a period of massive layoffs, stock market drops, and foreclosures that hit the aspirational middle class particularly hard. Controlling for all these unusual conditions means most households would usually have more day-to-day -day satisfaction because they wouldn't be hurting from watching all their accumulated wealth disappear, which is one of those problems that lower income households just don't have. You can't lose wealth if you've never had it in the first place. Now, it's a real shame that this figure has embedded itself into the public psyche because it actually does a lot of harm. In a more recent study on the exact same issue, researchers found a significant dip in the same happiness metrics among households that earned over $75,000 per year. A significant contributor to this strange anomaly was that people had thought that they made it to peak happiness when the reality was very different. So the question is, how much money do you need to maximize happiness? And the answer is more. And while this sounds like the most unsatisfying answer there is, it's just about as accurate as it gets. The findings from all similar studies on this issue have found that overall happiness increases with income, whilst negative emotions fall at a similar rate without any perceivable plateau at a particular income level. It does, however, have a logarithmic relationship leading to diminishing returns of every additional dollar. What this means is that if a person went from an income level of $25,000 per year to $50,000 per year, their happiness metrics might increase by 50%. If someone added the same $25,000 pay raise to a salary of $250,000, that impact would be far less significant. Instead, they would need to increase their salary by $250,000 per year to achieve the same increase in happiness as a low-income household. Happiness builds with proportional increases in income, not nominal increases. Hence, the other reason you need more income to be happy. People were found to be most satisfied if they were receiving consistent, predictable increases in their income through pay raises, promotions, or business growth. A constant upwards trajectory from a modest income was far more mentally satisfying than income that is stagnant or declining, even if it was several times larger to begin with. Which makes sense. A constant supply of small rewards keeps the happy brain juices flowing. The final thing to understand about this headline is how the data actually works. When researchers analyze the data, they look for far more than just a simple correlation. They also look for how significant the data is or how much of the outcome is explained by the relationship between what they were studying. In this case, it would be the relationship between happiness and income, as opposed to the millions of other factors that contribute to happiness. The researchers of the original paper found that this relationship accounted for about 37% of the expected variance, which is huge. But it still means 63% of people's happiness was determined by other factors. These other factors are things like health, meaningful relationships with family and friends, and even things with a negative relationship with income like work-life balance. The upshot of this is that someone on a modest income could be happier than a very wealthy person who was unhealthy, lonely, and constantly stressed over work they couldn't separate themselves from. But let us know what you think. How much money do you think you would need to be happy? The comment section helps out the channel, and it would be really interesting to see all the different opinions on this. Thanks for learning how money works.